talking. Ah, geez, I didn't write out the questions again here, so hang on just a sec here. Jeez. Uh, welcome to episode 94 of Farming Markets. This is the show where participants only get five minutes to state their opinions, and the person with the most time at the end wins, but there are no prizes. Today, we are talking about auto debt, Chinese real estate, women in crypto, smaller homes, and restaurant orders. Five years ago, there was a dozen models of new cars that sold for less than $20,000. In 2023, there was only one. Automakers, learned, uh, automakers leaned into their pricing power during the pandemic, giving priority to selling more expensive vehicles and features as supply chain issues constrained inventories and shoppers had more savings from, pan, from pandemic stimulus packages. Now, there are signs that the market might already be struggling to sustain itself. And among those who braved the markets at its, height, uh, at its highest prices last year, many are already struggling to keep up with their payments. The performance of loans issued in the first half of last year at the peak of the price surge has been specifically poor. Defaults and missed payments on pools of auto loans made in the first half of last year to people with subpar credit are matching or outpacing those issued in 2008, according to an analysis published last week by the S&P Global that called the data ominous. Uh, but is, is uh, the, the surmounting um, uh, rate of auto loans, is that bad enough to harm the actual economy? <laughs> uh, so if we're specifically talking, you know, failure of auto loans, uh, that's probably a bigger issue for the financial sector than it is necessarily for manufacturers. As long as people keep selling or pe keep, people keep buying cars, you know, the bank can repossess them all they want. Now, ultimately, yeah, that's that's bad for the economy. But uh, um, it's it's worth noting that slowing down of automotive sales is can be can be both a cause and an effect of, of a declining economy. Uh, we figured this out back in the uh, mid 2000s. If, if people remember, they had to bail out the auto industry because the industry was being un becoming uncompetitive. Uh, people weren't buying the cars. There was a risk of layoffs. And when, you know, millions of auto workers lose their jobs, tens of millions of people who live in towns uh, with those factories lose their jobs from, you know, fast food workers or janitors, school teachers, you know, tax revenues decline is basically a disaster. Um, so if, it, if it's the loans that kick it off or if it's like consumers slowing down their auto purchases, uh, in general, either way, it's it's worth watching whether or not uh, car sales are declining because uh, that could cause some really bad problems in wide swaths of the American economy. There's there's certainly some parallels here. I don't think it's it's going to be as extreme. I think folks are just going to adapt. You know, I don't think it is sustainable. Car prices are pretty ridiculous right now, especially for trucks. So I think more and more people just seek to uh, to um, not buy vehicles new, uh, maybe not buy vehicles as frequently. So they'll change their, their consumer behavior. Now, it is kind of similar to 2008 in the fact that defaults are going up. Um, I wouldn't say it's a surge like we saw in 2008, but they are starting with those subprime borrowers. And I guess this article uh, referenced that um, there's more subprime um, car loan defaults than there were in the uh, in the 2008 um uh, mortgage defaults. So, so that's kind of concerning. Um, and also that car loans, they are securitized, um, just like as mortgage were, they were, these mortgages were bundled back in 2008. Now, I don't think there's any like CDOs or, um, derivative products, uh, going into these. If there are, that would be kind of concerning, but the U S economy isn't propped up by the, the, uh, the car loan, uh, industry, um, home loans, uh, were, and so if there was a massive default on these car loans, I don't think it would have this uh, cascading effect and crash the economy. I think it's just going to be uh, interesting to watch on a consumer level. When, whenever the government intervenes into the economy to raise or lower the price of a good and service, they generally experience the exact opposite outcome from what was intended. Uh, if you remember the Cash for Clunkers uh, program back in 2009, it virtually wiped out all the affordable cars that people were driving. And, and then the incentives were created for, for automobile manufacturers to put in all sorts of extremely expensive amenities into these vehicles 
that drove the prices to the point where they're unaffordable. Well, political administrations, they, they can't afford to have goods and services that everybody wants to be unaffordable. So they start coming up with all of these different programs so that the poor can actually afford them. But there's usually a shelf life on these programs. So in our minds, we think that we'll help people out for three years. And then at the end of the three years, everything will be hunky dory. And then we'll take the program away. The thing is, you can't just take the program away. So now after the COVID pandemic and all that free money that was floating around the economy is drying up, we still have those expensive cars that manufacturers were incentivized to, to provide. And now people can't afford them. I don't think this is going to be the cause. I think it's more of a symptom of an economy that's in decline. So uh, I, I don't think this will be the, 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 the straw that breaks the camel's back. I just think this is one of several straws that leads to me to believe that uh, we can't continue this economic pace with the kind of policies that we're currently living under. <clears throat> I, I thought the I thought the article was somewhat hyperbolic because it's like you know we haven't seen this much uh, delinquency since 2008, and I actually found on Y charts they have U.S. auto loan delinquencies by 90 days or more, and when I'm looking at it in 2008, U.S. auto loan de, de, uh, delinquencies peaked at 5.27 percent, and in uh, in 2020 it peaked at uh, 5.03 percent. And it's declined uh, since then. So right now we're sitting at five or three point eight two percent. There was a surge in the first quarter where it went up from three point seven percent to three point eight two percent. But I'm not so sure I'd classify that as surging uh, amount of delinquencies. So I guess at, at this point, no, I, I'm not concerned about it because it, it seems to be tapering off. Um, it's it's not tapering off as fast as it did in 2008. But I thought the I thought I thought, I thought the article was a little was a little um, mm -hmm. was painting a a worse picture than it than it actually looks like when you zoom the chart back a little bit. Um, my my only other concern was is that I read about a third of these uh, these car loans that were issued to some part credit are just students that have uh, student loan debt that and I can't remember mm -hmm. when did they have to start paying that back? Did that, did that October I believe October first. Interest is accruing in September, but October first is when it's first is when it's due. Okay, so like if a third of those, you know, that combined with student loan payments, that made it, that would be more concerning. But from what I'm looking at in this chart, it looks like it's following a similar pattern to 2008. So at this point, I'm not really concerned. Um, I guess I'll, I'll keep watching it, but um, but it looks like it did did taper off quite a bit. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see here. So the financial struggles of Country Garden Holdings, China's top. Uh, uh, surviving privately run developers, so real estate developer, have been front and center, front and center since it missed interest payments on two U.S. dollar uh, bonds a week ago. The property giant said over the weekend that trading in 11 of its uh, yuan-denominated domestic bonds has been suspended and that it, it, it intends to discuss repayment plans with investors. Country Gardens Hong Kong listed shares which had been uh, relegated to penny stocks last week, fell another 18% on Monday. So taking into the account that C Country Gardens issues, Evergrande recently filed for bankruptcy. Where do you see the Chinese economy as a whole in five years? Uh, well, we, we've talked about China a decent amount in, you know, week after week on the, on the show. And uh, I'm just going to sound like a little bit of a broken record here, but China, as you, as you knew it for you know, 20, 30 years after the Cold War is probably finished. Uh, they're the most indebted country in the nation in the history of the world, as far as we can tell. Um, and a lot of their debt is piled up in the home building sector. Uh, and that's how they generate a ton of GDP growth. Um, they use the home building and other real estate development as as a as asset disposal. They basically overproduce basically every you know raw commodity and home building commodity you can you can imagine. And in order to do something with it, they build high rises that nobody lives in, and then the five years later they demolish them, rebuild them, and count that as GDP growth. Um, so. What they're doing now is basically playing a shell game with all their debt. They're trying to hide it in different public banks, private banks, public corporations, government guarantees, all that stuff. Putting a timetable on when it's all going to blow up in their face is, is difficult. But sooner rather than later, it is going to blow up in their face. Um, 
intelligence agencies watching China are, are saying that they're quietly moving troops to the coast. Buildup will probably be complete in 24 or 2025 for a possible attack on Taiwan, which may or may not come. Um, state propaganda is saying that a poor but independent China is preferable to a, you know, Western dependent but wealthier China. So the, clearly the Chinese are getting ready for at some point things to get much worse economically. Five years from now, don't know. I would probably take the under on five years rather than the over. But at some point, the party is going to end for China and um, it's probably not going to be pretty from an economic standpoint. Yeah, I think um, Alex said it well. I, I think more, more and more folks are starting to see China as less of a threat and more of a, of a paper tiger these days. And I think certainly that pattern is going to continue for the next five years. Um, as far as country garden, um, country gardens, country garden, as far as they go, um, this is what happens when you abuse debt. You know, they really put themselves in this precarious position. They had 194 billion in liabilities at the end of last year. And essentially, they've just been building new units um, all on debt. And many of these units are never completed, and they're, they're not even producing any revenue. Um, like Alex said, they just build them, destroy them, build them again. Now, the Chinese market has slowed way down. Prices on these units are dropping, and there's few of these units being sold. So just like with Evergrande, another behemoth Chinese property uh, uh, management or uh, development company, the problems could spill um, over into China and uh, beyond just that of bondholders. Um, unlike... America, the Chinese don't hold as much savings in banks or investments or wealth products, but they, they hold a lot more in real property. So country gardens, um, their issues create potential for huge personal losses right at a time when the Chinese government needs consumers to spend and to borrow just to keep the economy uh, going. So this is going to be a this is going to be a big mess. Um, the government will probably step in, is my guess. They'll probably try to restructure and, and reorganize um, uh, country gardens. And try to make right by bond holders holders but going forward china's they're going to have a track uh trouble attracting foreign investment in real estate and i think this is going to spill over to into other sectors of the chinese economy so um to answer the question in five years i think it's going to be an even bigger mess than it is now my 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 question for situations like this is to, is, is to ask what will desperate governments do when they have a population of desperate voters well, we don't have any voters in China, but we certainly have voters in the United States, and China does hold a lot of our debt. So the question is, is that uh, when our two-year treasury bonds or two-year treasury notes come due, are the Chinese going to buy more, or are they going to say, nah, just send us our money back? Where is that, where is that capital going to come from? So we are intertwined. Where do I think China is going to be five years from now? Well, that's really a result of uh, whether China continues to tighten down on its economy like it has over the last 10 years, where it's more centrally planned, or is it going to loosen up and become more decentralized? Uh, if, if they become more centralized, I think they're going to be relegated to third world status like they were before. And it'll primarily be the Asian version of Greece and, uh, and, the, and the pig countries of Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, when all their uh, catastrophic loans started coming due. If they become decentralized, I think it's quite possible for the Chinese to grow themselves out of this problem. Remains to be seen which path they take. Yeah, every time I read about it, I get more concerned because it's not like you have a, it's not like you can do what our central bank is doing and just decrease interest rates and uh, you know you know print more money because at some point, even if you do cut interest rates and print more money, you, you can't. I mean, they've already built so much that even if you want to like try and make make work pro, uh, projects. Like you've already made all the make work projects that you can make and there's like literally no more make work projects to to do at this point i mean you already have like drew said like skyscrapers just sitting empty empty with nobody to use them so it's like at some point like you're gonna have to deal with the problem you can't just keep printing and stimulating your way out of it because at some point there's there's just there's nothing left to build so i don't know I, i'm you know it, increasingly fascinated by the other uh, by the problem we, they have over there and uh, we'll be interested to see where they end up in the next five years because i like right now i i just i just i don't see how you how you how you deal with this problem in a uh in a good way so, i don't know all right <clears throat> all right so actresses gwyneth paltrow reese witherspoon 
Myla Kunis, something like that, have a new message for empowerment for women, a new message of empowerment for women. They say it's time to embrace crypto. <clears throat> they are among a wave of female celebrities pitching cryptocurrencies and NFTs to women, saying that the unregulated volatile market is a boys club and that they can breach. Uh, stopping short of directly telling their audience to invest, they call for women to do their research and enter the arena. The time is now, they say, to develop a sisterhood of crypto enthusiasts. Do, are, they, are they like a day late and a dollar short uh, for, for this thing? Or do you think that the timing's good on this? Well, I guess if you're looking to make like thousands or tens of thousands of percent returns on crypto, that day has probably passed, though who really knows? Uh, ultimately, I'd like to know who's paying them to say this. You know, are they part of a sponsorship deal or something? Uh, if there are women out there who are interested in crypto, though, you know, just buyer beware because it's got no real world use and it largely trades on little more than supply and demand. So, again, if you're interested, just buyer beware. Make sure you don't uh, invest any money you can't afford to lose. I found this article a, a bit cringy. I mean, first of all, <laughs> Cryptocurrency isn't isn't this like he-man woman hater club that these celebrity women are making it out to be. Last time I checked, Binance, Coinbase, Crypto.com, they don't care if you're a man or a woman. There's absolutely no discrimination against women if they want to spend their money on these NFTs or these new celebrity issues of cryptocurrency. So I think that uh, my, my lacunas, Gwyneth Paltrow, Reith Witherspoon, I think Paris Hilton as well, um, who uh, they, they think that they're championing women's equality. They're actually doing this disturb disservice by pushing these garbage products on women, telling them that they have this responsibility to equal the gender gap by purchasing their NFTs or private issue crypto. Now, if we want to discuss epistemic responsibility, I think shedding light on the potential scams of these products comes way higher on the priority list. Now, one thing that these celebrity women do have in common is they're all invested heavily in cryptocurrencies and NFTs. And like Alex said, Alex said some of these um, women actually get paid for their advertising. Now, at the end of the day, the disparity in men to woman crypto investment boils down to general gender behavior. Men are known to take more risks, including really, really stupid risks sometimes. And this has been known from gambling uh, in casinos to investing to hang gliding and free solo rock climbing. So, I mean, by, by the way, the fact that more women don't go rock climbing without a rope doesn't mean that free solo rock climbing is systemically sexist. It means that women have better sense and greater self-preservation instincts. So the argument here is invest in crypto just because men are doing it. I don't think that's, that's a good argument. If you really want to be a champion for women in investing, be like Sue Zorsman. Teach them about financial planning principles, compound interest, Roth IRA, stocks, bonds, index funds, ETF, ETFs. Um, honestly, the fact that these celebrity women are leveraging this, this gender victimhood just to sell their own products seems very irresponsible. I'm not so sure I'm going to take investment advice from these women. Um, it's kind of like <laughs> taking relationship advice from these women. Their, their, their track record seems a little sketchy. Um, quite frankly, uh, do do any of you gentlemen know anybody personally who's become wealthy as a result of uh, cryptocurrency trading? Uh, Tom, you're 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 on Twitter occasionally, and I am too. I don't know if you're as attractive to Chinese Bitcoin traders like I am, but uh, uh, not a day goes by that I don't have a new follower who happens to be incredibly attractive, incredibly wealthy. At least the photos seem to uh, you know suggest that they're really wealthy who want me to get into crypto trading. So uh, um, I, I think we're basically seeing the death rattle of the Bitcoin trading industry. And this is just the last push. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, would, I would have more respect for them if they're just say, hey, let's, you know, let's, let's start getting women investing in like stocks. But when you come out and you're like, let's do crypto, it's like, oh man, <laughs> like, uh, like who, who's the guy that did that uh, uh, FTX commercial? Did, did Matt we talk, oh, this? Matt Damon. Yeah, somebody should call Matt Damon and be like, hey, how, how do you feel after you, you pump this for like a year? And then it just like, like even like FTX, the company is like now non-existent. Ugh. I want to know how yeah. they went, went bankrupt or lost money relative to the, the guys who made money. Yeah. See if it's still a good deal. I don't know. I don't know. All right. <clears throat> 
All right, uh, let's see here. So, so home prices are near record highs, frustrating millions of potential buyers who feel priced out of the housing market. Home builders are having to find ways to make their product more affordable to increase the pool of consumers. Shrinking the size of a new single family home is an increasingly popular way to do it. Smaller homes can help cost constrained buyers facing mortgage rates. They also boost the bottom line for builders who are contending with spiraling labor and construction costs. What do you think about building smaller homes? Do you think that's like feasible? Uh, smaller homes is probably not a bad idea overall. I mean, a lot of people probably don't need 3,000 square foot, five bed, three and a half bath homes if it's just a retired couple, you know. But uh, I I think overall, this is just kind of a stopgap measure. Um, I think the housing market nationally has basically three main problems for the, for decades now. Uh, at the local level, you have terrible housing policies from zoning regulations. State state level, you have tax problems. And at the federal level, you have historically low interest rates. And all these have combined to constrict supply and rapidly increase demand. And the end result is inevitable. Sky high prices that have done basically nothing but go up since the early 1980s. You have to correct all three of those problems if you want to solve the housing affordability crisis in the United States. And nobody really wants to do any of it because 40 years ago people decided that owning a home was more an investment than a place to live and when you look at a home that's supposed to give you a return on investment rather than a place where human beings are supposed to live indoors you end up with problems like we have today i'm out of time oh <laughs> i i have to say that uh, um the, the the price of housing is is going to be pretty close to the amount of capital available to the individual home buyer. So if the federal government starts tightening up on how much money is available for people to, to buy houses, and right now they are tightening, uh, you're going to see less money available. Well, builders and developers and, and buyers are all going to still want to do business with one another. The houses will just get smaller. I, I think it's just a market response to our reality. Uh, I'd be surprised. I tried to build like a thousand square foot home a couple of years ago, but like I have all these, uh, what they call C the, the CCNRs or, or whatever they called, like good, good, good luck trying to build a smaller house. I mean, um, a lot of the neighborhoods in the Valley don't, don't allow you to build a small house. Um, you know, the smallest I think I was able to build was like 1200 square feet. But recently I, mm -hmm. I have not seen any neighborhood where you can build a house um, as small as some of these people are talking about. Um, and then they also have like a bunch of like covenants, like where you have to have like so many gables and, and certain kinds of siding and stuff like that. So I, I don't know how realistic that is, at least in the valley here. <clears throat> All right. Uh, last question here is that New York City's uh, Club 54 used to see a steady stream of orders for burgers and healthier entrees, such as the chili rub skirt steak with bliss potatoes or the rib sticking pasta dish dish. Um, these days, uh, the venue is seeing orders simpler yet stranger. Restaurant managers um, say the uh, patrons are ordering a salad and a serving of fries as a complete meal. Um, do, do, do you like as the like yeah, the article doesn't seem to seem think these things go together? But do you think a salad and French fries is that a complete meal uh, to you? <clears throat> We're out of time. time. Oh, Alex is out of time. Drew's out of time. So I guess Joe, it's you. <laughs> yep. No, I don't think they go together. <laughs> yeah, me, me either. No. <laughs> Great. Yeah, let's put a cap on this one. So. <laughs> yeah, the one got a little wire one. there today. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, that that's it uh, for episode ninety-four of Farm Market. We'll see you again next week.